justice aspect of this is really important. I was in the CIA's counterterrorism center for a while, and I can tell you that the chance that this is going to make a big difference in terms of the strategy, in terms of the Islamic State going forward, it's TBD, but the history of this would be that Abu Musab al Zarqawi, I know you know this, after he got taken out, the insurgency in Iraq actually got a lot worse. So it's a good thing, we should celebrate, he needed to die, or needed to be justice, I should say. If he had turned himself in, maybe they would have taken him. He suicided himself, by the way. The suicide vest killed three of his own children, I believe, right? Wasn't that who he was with? If there's mixed reports about whether his kids, whether it's his wives. Right. There's right. an unknown number of other ISIS fighters who were killed, apparently, that we'll get an estimate on that soon. But, I mean, cutting the head off the snake is something you have to do, but the snake doesn't necessarily die. Keep that in mind. So the Islamic State will probably fight, or will fight on, certainly. Yeah, just to, to build on what Buck said, and, and one of the pieces that I think people should know, look, it, it is a significant, very significant blow um, coming back to Adi, but what, what the, was, let, was um, also reported was that the Special Forces guys stayed on site for approximately another two and a half hours, collecting intel, hard drives, servers, taking back other folks who are, they captured alive, which they'll gather intelligence on in terms of structure, future operations, financing, movements. I mean, so... The, it's like a trove like we saw with Bin Laden. Right, just like in the Bin Laden case, there was lots and lots of raw intel which will have to be developed and built upon. That is equally as significant as taking out the leader um, is, uh, is, that, is that part. And then to, to go shift from a foreign policy perspective to a, a pure political perspective, I think um, this really plays a strength in the... Uh, President Trump's hand in this ongoing impeachment inquiry that somehow the president's out of control, the, the national security apparatus is in dis disarray, that nothing can be done, that he that he's doesn't know what he's doing. This is a, a pretty well-coordinated, well, um, well-thought-out plan that's been in the, in the making for several months, if not years, and, and it really does um, kind of put a little stability into an otherwise very, um, very rocky, turbulent month for the president. I should point out briefly that, based on all the reporting, what the president has said, zero U.S. casualties. This, this is a completely successful operation. And Tom, as I briefly mentioned, the New York Times this morning is reporting that Baghdadi arrived at this location about 48 hours ago, but we were getting ready for the operation a week ago. So there's clearly a really good source of intelligence. That's got to spook ISIS as well. That's another sort of side benefit of this, it would seem. Yeah, and you know, obviously Buck could comment more on this, but it seems that based on that intelligence, there was a ground uh, of either a CIA officer or allied intelligence officer or agent that was recruited to providing this site intelligence. Um, I think one thing that's very interesting here as well is the risk factor, the complexity, moving through Russian controlled airspace. The Russians sometimes like to mess around with us. Fortunately, they didn't on this occasion. Uh, and I, I had it from a very good source that it was uh, Delta Force's A squadron. They have a number of combat squadrons, and it was a, in, it was a squadron assault. So the entire, about 120 guys getting out there to do that, to fly that low, the Night Stalkers and Elite Army Helicopter Squadron, uh, get in, get out, no casualties, that takes a hell of a lot of uh, skill, uh, which sometimes we underestimate, certainly our allies. Uh, growing up in the UK, uh, people would always say, well, you Americans, it's, it's all kit, as in it's all technology. You can't do this unless you have exceptionally uh, capable uh, people across the board uh, in both the logistics intel operations side. So, very impressive. I think it points out the, uh, the necessity for deep coordination with allies, but also for the ongoing work of the national security apparatus, independent of any political entity. And so this is really a win for what has otherwise been called the deep state, which are the professionals, the folks who are bipartisan, who work on the ground because they are serving their country. Now, messaging around it is always interesting to see whether it's who gets credit and how it plays. It certainly strengthens Trump's hand at this time to come back with a foreign policy win, particularly in the region where he's been under attack by Republicans and his own party um, the last couple of weeks. I was in the uh, Obama administration when the UBL raid happened, uh, and the, we were very careful about how we talked about allies' work and how we didn't talk about the specifics of the operation. Not talking about the specifics of the operation was, you know, we call email 
operational security, um, but did raise questions from some people about whether or not it actually even happened, right? It, it raises that when you are not transparent um, as you can be, it raises concerns that, well, is this some kind of uh, uh, internationally, like, well, did this ever even really happen? We never saw a body for UVL. Um, so conspiracy theories really abound in that space. On the flip side, um, you saw what President did this morning, in which he gave a ton of detail. Um, that raises- And they chased him down this tunnel, and then he was sniveling, and then he blew himself yeah, up. Yeah, that starts to raise questions on the other side of how much information are you giving, and how much are you trying to credit um, one individual for this versus a whole operation. And it's funny to see, you know, of course there's a tweet for everything with President Trump, um, but back in 2012, he had said, well, Obama should stop talking about this. The credit goes to the special operations forces. So that'll be interesting to see how this plays out now that ultimately President Trump is in exactly the same situation as Barack Obama of taking down a leader of a counterterrorism organization that was a threat to the nation. What would be the, because I remember it, it, it definitely was a political thing back then too, right? GM is alive, Bin Laden is dead, right? That was one of the talking points. What would the downside be, and I'm not asking this in a hostile way, I'm genuinely curious, what would the downside be of sharing with the American people the specific TikTok of how this guy died? I think some of it comes down to the tradition and concerns of folks who are in national security who prefer, the, you know, less, they think less information is better for the operation. I, as a communicator, was always pushing for more because I do think people need to know uh, and have an awareness of what people are doing in their name uh, in behalf of national security. Can you talk um, about just, and we'll come back to the rest of the panel, but uh, you... Like, for example, um, I think there's a big difference from when uh, Saddam Hussein's uh, was captured and his sons were taken. I didn't love that there were photos of them being beaten up and dragged around um, all over TV and on newspapers, but it was acknowledged that this happened. Um, so I think there should be a balance struck between that and then just the immediate burial at sea of Osama bin Laden, um, and nobody ever really saw what happened. So I think there's a balance of don't glorify and dance on the graves of your enemy, but also be transparent with the American public uh, about what's happened so people people can move on. I was just gonna say, if I remember correctly, after the bin Laden raid, there was an unprecedented degree of specifics and sharing about the raid. I'm not saying from any particular individual in the White House, I believe there was even reports of criminal referrals about that. Uh, I do know for a fact that somebody uh, wrote a book, and I think he lost all seven million dollars that he got from the book. Right? So, when Bin Laden raid happened, a lot of people were talking about a lot of stuff, whether it was from the White House or from other people. Right, which is clearly the, like the official message versus the okay. Well, everyone knows they've got good. Everyone knows they've got a good story, and people want so to share right. it. So, but, but I mean, the, the stuff all got out, and it got out in a way that I think some some people were were concerned about it. And as to the messaging. On the more political side, in case you didn't, uh, as we're going to be talking, I'm sure, about foreign policy and how the elites feel about it versus this whole America First concept. This was a headline today, and I actually did not believe it, and I had to go check and check and recheck. Headline today from the Washington Post, I think the second most esteemed liberal paper in the country. Maybe for some of you, it's the most esteemed liberal paper. Abu Bakr al Baghdadi, austere religious scholar at helm of Islamic State, dies at 48. And as I said to Guy backstage, I mean, he was very strict, so I guess that's technically true, um, but that's a bizarre error to make for people who are working at this level and on this kind of well, issue. And, I would and Buck, the original headline from the Post, they yeah. called him Terrorist, terrorist in Chief. chief. They, they nailed it. They changed it to that. Yes. I feel like if Mitch McConnell were to die tomorrow, the headline would be much harsher than the Washington <laughs> Post. 100%. Um, and I, I just think, you know, you also, I mean, uh, my, my friend Tom here mentioned the coordination issue. People are saying, well, because the Russians knew about this, this is, when I say people, I mean, they're journalists. We're talking about, well, this just goes to show that Putin is such a close ally, Trump is Putin's puppet. Well, it could show that, or it could show you that if you fly an elite special operations unit into Russian airspace where they have MiGs and advanced missile defense systems, uh, service to air defense systems, you could also just blow all of our guys out of the sky because we didn't coordinate. Them. To be so, fair, the fact that the president first thanked Russia was a little concerning versus thanking even his own special operations folks. That's that's part of where the, the coordination on the ground between countries is necessary and amazing. This is where I say that's different than how leaders message and talk about their own involvement and their own experience. If, if someone up here is going to defend the precision of Trump's messaging, it will not be me. As much as I think he's great, it will not be me. 
So, so I was just going to say also, the president's oversharing a bit on, in terms of how you know how the operation went down and uh, some of the specifics as to um, Al Baghdadi's death. I think was was very purposeful in, in terms of not allowing Baghdadi to be seen as some martyr dying a heroic death, but rather you know sniff like <laughs> crying and grabbing his kids in an act of cowardice and, and, and dying a very a death as a coward, not as a, a fighter or as a martyr. I think that's what the messaging was was kind of intended to do. Yeah, notice how these guys never go out Scarface, by the way. You know what I mean? They never, they always do this one. Yeah. And, and just the operational aspect of it, talking about the rush, I spent a good deal of time in the military up the road here the, at Fort Campbell. And so for a package like that, for 100 plus operators, plus dogs, plus, 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 you're talking probably an airlift of a probably 20, 20 aircraft, roughly helicopters, backup helicopters, you know, drones. I mean, so it's, it's very important the, as much as you hate to acknowledge that the, the Russians and the Syrians and everybody, that's a large package of, of aircraft flying. E even if you're flying Napa the Earth, you know, 100 feet above the ground, still can be, can be shot down. That requires a great deal of coordination. And on the detail and then the level of that, this guy in particular was just absolute human garbage. He was a butcher, he was a rapist, and so to hear how he went out the way he did is on a, a significant level. Actually, it's so violent that there were concerns of, I mean, Al Qaeda that he's too violent. Yeah, yeah that's, you know, you know, you're really yeah. effed up when Al Qaeda's like, ooh, yeah, dial sure, that uh, our colleagues, yeah. Uh, So, yeah, no, it's, it's satisfying though, to hear how this ended. So, I want to widen it out then to sort of get us on track to, to the broader picture here of what the panel is going to be about. This is, as you say, a huge win for the U.S. And the president, of course, uh, is, is a big part of that. In this region where in northern Syria and everything going on with Turkey and the abandonment of the Kurds, there's been a lot of incoming criticism, not just from the opposition, but from his own party. Here is clearly a big W sort of on that front right in the region. How much does that mitigate that issue for him politically? Uh, and is that, a, is that sort of like a temporary win? And then we come back to the the policy, which is still, I think, in a lot of people's view, problematic, and other people's view, it's the right thing. Yeah, and it, it just quickly, one thing to look for here, which will be very interesting, I suspect there will be a lot fewer leaks from Delta operators who are on the raid than on the Bin Laden thing, because the culture between Delta Force and the SEALs is very different, much more secrecy-driven in Delta. I, I, I think, though, on the political point, from my opinion, obviously people here, probably will disagree, may disagree. I, the Syria withdrawal was a bad decision. It was mitigated somewhat by the decision to retain some forces in Derizor, which is the eastern province uh, of Syria, which is along Al-Qaeda in Iraq. Buck was killing them, and uh, the rat lines between Iraq and Syria up the Euphrates, that's a good thing. That mitigates somewhat. Uh, there is the problem, though, of the withdrawal. Politically, though, this allows the president to make the case to people who perhaps are not as engaged as others to say, actually, look, I'm keeping you safe, I'm delivering effect. So politically, I do, I do think it will provide the president some insulation, even though I would suggest it shouldn't. David, I want to ask you about the president's interactions with Erdogan, the leader of Turkey, because his diplomats made it very clear, they wanted every journalist to know that when President Trump wrote that sort of threatening letter, Erdogan threw it immediately in the garbage, did exactly what he was going to do, dictated to the U.S. what Turkey was going to do. Um, you know, it, it seems like all of the sanctions have been lifted. Erdogan's coming to D.C. next month. Last time he was in town, his thugs beat up a bunch of peaceful protesters with impunity. It, it seems like when there's a criticism made of the president on cable news from a political opponent, he'll nuke them on Twitter, but he's willing to take a lot of punches to the ribs from someone like Erdogan. It's, it's a strange paradox in my mind. So, so you know, Turkey's a, obviously a very problemsome nation in a, in a wide range of issues. You know, we want to keep them as a NATO ally, we want to keep them in the inside the tent versus outside the tent. And, and just how you do that is, is very troubling because you have a, you have a leader, Erdogan, who, who doesn't necessarily represent any views that if we, we, anyone here in this panel or in the audience would, would share. But at the same time, is, is you know, has a, has a constituency of his own at home, right? And, and a lot of this, the, 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 the rolling across into Syria was done for political reasons uh, that, that he needed to accomplish, right? Four million Syrian refugees. You have the, the uh, you know, the, the part of the uh, Syrian Defense Force, which were the terrorist portion of the, the Kurdish 
uh, forces kind of having cross-border raids, you know, lots of problems for Erdogan. Erdogan kind of calls up, says to the president, we're coming, we don't care. You guys got about a dozen, two dozen special forces guys in the way, 24 to 50 operators there in the, in, in the road. Get them out or they're gonna be in harm's way, right? I, I don't know if there was a good situation and you're gonna say, well, come, we'll fight you. Right? Are you gonna have a, are you gonna fight a shooting war in Syria in that case when Erdogan says, I'm coming? I mean, for a long time, I think the president called his bluff and said, you come, we'll fight you. And I think on that phone call, that particular instance, Erdogan said, we, we, we're coming at this point in time. I, I'm not sure. I, I don't know. I've not been present amongst those conversations. The, the note, I, I did talk to National Security Advisor about the note that was written that said, you know, you're, you're the devil, right? It's, right? It doesn't translate that great. You know, when, you're, when you read it in Turkish, it's a little bit even more harsher and, and uh, it was, it's even worse than the Turkish yeah, yeah, it's, it's a lot worse than devil in Turkish it's a it's a really I mean it seems a little bit juvenile if you read it but in Turkish it, it comes across a lot more meaningful and so well, but it, it, there, there, there's it a lot the of there's a lot of give and take it went so Nate let me just right. ask you this because I like the the term that was used there inside the tent or outside the tent where is Turkey really on that? Where should they be? Because they are in NATO, but in many ways they are acting very much like the opposite of an ally. Well, and that's part of the challenge right now in, in the current state of American foreign policy is that the United States is not fully in the tent either right now. And so when you have... Um, what do you mean by that? And what I mean is that we have in our leadership a president who doesn't really get along with many of the leaders in the NATO country. And frankly, in, in many ways, personality-wise, he is more similar to Erdogan in the way they approach things. One of the diplomatic solutions to having a phone call like that, where a leader, a charismatic leader calls and says, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this, is to say, that's great. Um, by the way, I'm gonna call up all eight of the other folks. We're gonna sanction you if you go ahead and move this. Like, you use all the tools in your toolbox. It's not necessarily two leaders going at it. It's the whole point of having a NATO coalition. Erdogan is not as popular among his own population um, absent an economic surge. So sanctions actually be very, very powerful and very painful for him and would at least have forced him to question and step back from this immediate type of rolling in. This is the challenge ultimately of not having um, a trust in your own national security apparatus because this is frankly the advice that any diplomat and any military professional around him who would be engaged in strategy and normally would be on those phone calls would have given him. So I just, I wanted to step back because th th there's obviously very high level discussion going on among my colleagues here, some specifics in, in Syria. And I know we're gonna talk about the American war, but just America first. So if I could for a second, uh, all of the things that we're discussing right now about coordination and the way things are usually done, I think it's worth remembering that the president, for example, has been promising to get out of Syria from the very beginning, that the president has been looking at foreign policy, particularly in the Middle East, but in general, uh, but let's go back to the Middle East for a second, as a bipartisan failure, and a bipartisan failure not to understand long-term consequences and to drive foreign policy with what will seem to be the short-term expedient, whether it's coordinating or unilateral action, whatever it may be. So effectively, he looks at what's going on, and I, I told you I worked in the Counterterrorism Center of the CIA. I also worked in the Iraq office of the CIA. And those of you who remember the Bush administration will remember that that is an office that certainly got its fair share. I wasn't there when it happened, so you cannot blame me. Um, I came after the whole invasion and WMD situation. But you look at the, I mean, if you're really being fair-minded about it, and on foreign policy, we're supposed to, right? This is where you know, partisanship ends at, at our borders, and we're supposed to think about what's best for America. I, I think that there's a very strong case to be made that certainly the last two administrations, and I say this as, as a Republican, um, failed dramatically uh, in the Middle East. Um, and when I say Middle East, I'm really including South Asia in that. And if you want to stop what you're doing, if you think what you're doing is failure, you're going to have to change processes. I mean, the perfect example is, is Afghanistan. I, mean, I was in Afghanistan a decade ago. The talking points today about why we shouldn't leave Afghanistan are the same they were 10 years ago. I was sitting in meetings, you know, four-star generals, people that are supposed to know everything. We're gonna do it, we're gonna win, we're gonna... It's not going to happen. And if you're gonna wait until ground-based conditions when the Taliban is never going to be strong enough to threaten the territorial integrity of the rest of the country, um, you're going to be there for so if you want to be there forever understand that that is and by the way people say forever wars I'm talking about forever deployments in places that are still in active states of war 
which is different than South Korea, it's different than Germany, it's different than some of the places we have bases. So the president comes in, and I know, sorry, this, is, this could be a long thing, but the president comes in and says, we're not going to keep doing what has been done. And I think one of the primary criticisms you hear, especially from the foreign policy establishment, of which I kind of was a little bit of a part for a while, is he's not doing it the way he's supposed to do it. And he looks back at them and says, I know you guys know a lot of stuff, but you've been messing up. We're not gonna do it the same way. I think that that's an important backdrop for all of the decisions. Although isn't, isn't part of not doing it the right way what he criticized his predecessor for very harshly when it came to Al-Qaeda and Iraq and then what led to ISIS and he's like, oh, Barack Obama caused ISIS by pulling out this, too soon. Real quick, right? I, I, wanna, I mean, I'm just, this is where people, and this is to your point, by the way, about how Trump said Russia first. If you're looking at the president for short-term messaging, if you're looking at how he does things, he's not a government guy. He doesn't really necessarily get into the intricacies or even some of, I think, the short-term consequences of what goes on. On the big strategic decisions, the Obama decision to leave Iraq, I think that hangs on that commander-in-chief's head. And I think that the president is right at the 30,000-foot level on these issues and is absolutely able to be and should be criticized at the whatever, what's below the 30, the 5,000. Nay, are you on the spot? On the ground, thank you. There we go. Yeah, the Iraq one is, a, is an interesting one because that's uh, the country voted to kick us out. Right? They, they, they said troops need to go. We don't want you guys anymore. The argument was that they didn't want a status of forces agreement. Yeah. That Biden wanted. I mean, right but me, meaning that. like status of forces, like there, there is, you're not going to keep troops in a place where there's no protections for them legally. Um, but I think there's a broader challenge here, and you can say that this started with the Obama administration, certainly, of a winding down of American influence overseas. Um, and I think that's only been cemented under a Trump administration because it's very easy in a political season for Democrats and Republicans to say things like, we need to end forever wars. Uh, and we need to bring our troops home. It plays very well, and um, everyone does it. But nobody actually, I'd say this again, for the Democrats or the Republicans right now, gets into, well then, what is the actual purpose of having troops, forward, forward operating troops, and engagement? Is it a, we're preventing a future 9-11? So we need to be engaged. Is it we're training and equipping other people to do this work for us? And so what I see is that this is ultimately we have an interest in being engaged in the world because frankly, we're all connected. We have to acknowledge we're all connected and deal with it somehow. I opt that it is, I posit that it is better to be engaged over there than it is to be dealing with it here in places like New York or now. Which is what President and Bush second, argued. Right, and secondly, but how you do that is important. And I think how you do that is you don't do it by saying America first, and it's actually America alone. You get other people to share the burden, and that's the entire purpose of NATO. The only time NATO has activated its troops is because the United States called on it to do so, 9-11 in the Afghan war. Oh, those, so, 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 so go ahead. let me just push back on the, we're not good NATO members, or we don't participate in NATO. Right now, or for the first time since World War II, NATO has a contingency, since World War II, as a contingency, a rotating contingency of 750 U.S. Marines on the Russian border. Right now, there's a brigade of U.S. Army, the tanks, in Poland on the Russian border. And just last week, a brigade of U.S. Army tanks was dispatched to Lithuania on the Russian border. So somehow that we are abandoning our NATO allies and we're not a, a vibrant part of NATO, you know, do, doesn't those, those issues don't play on the front page of the Post. You know, they're like, if you read Strat 4, Strat Com, or if you're, if you're in the minutia of what's going on in the U.S. military, you'll know those things. Those don't get wide play around, 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 the, around the world. And, and your, the but bigger point is the guy... What does end up getting play, right, is the fact that how the leaders talk to each other or don't talk to each other. Well, that, because the, that, and this, that, is like, this is the work of what we're calling the national security apparatus. Thank God for all of them. They get denigrated as a deep state right now, but they are still doing what is necessary for American national security. Yeah, but, but don't, don't mistake for one second that the President of the United States did not set, sign off on putting soldiers and troops in those countries in those ways. So, and, and then just to the, to the overarching theme, you know, Unless America can articulate a clear vision of why we're sending our sons and daughters, our most precious resources, into harm's way, why are we sending them there? This is our objective. This is, we're going there to do this, and we're getting out. Most Americans, I don't think, you know, in the Middle East, we've had a series, we haven't had a 19-year war. We've had 19 one-year wars on back. We don't have it, there's no strategy to get in and get out. I think people in America would, wouldn't mind, if I look, 
if it was a world, world War II, we were there for a long time fighting for a big cause. Nobody can articulate why we're there. There are Al Qaeda and ISIS in over 40 countries around the world. Somalia, Sudan, Chad, Niger, lots of places, lots of bad people in lots of bad places want to do harm to everybody in this audience. That doesn't mean we send troops there. So on the, that, on the that, issue of a clear that, vision, though. That, and that's the thing. I don't think anybody, and this includes the President of the United States right now, has really articulated what that is while being frank about the fact that we do have people overseas, right? We, we, we talked about the withdrawal of Syria, yet suddenly we have a thousand more people going in there Saudi. to protect and in Saudi Arabia, it's going to be a question of changing the change. But hang on, let me get to Tom. Because I, I want to ask about the, the clear vision and, and trying to articulate what something means. As far as you can tell, you follow this stuff for a living every day. What does America First actually mean in practice from this president? Well, I, I think one of the challenges with President Trump is the, and it cre creates some opportunities, unpredictability. But on NATO, for example, with the president. You know, I think deserves credit for uh, getting that increase in NATO defense spending. You know, Chancellor Merkel, Germany, people say, well, the relationship with Germany is poor. I'm sorry, I, I, you know, I'm an American who grew up in Europe. The Europeans will never put the money up for the tanks because ultimately German diplomats are not going to stop Russian combined arms formations surging through the Baltics. The Europeans will never pony up unless you hammer them. And the British and the French, to a degree, certainly Poland and the Baltics are, are pretty happy with this. The problem, then, is that President Trump sometimes brings into question Article 5, which is the, the flip switch. And Vladimir Putin's overarching idea is to fray the links between NATO members on Article 5. Um, so there's this unpredictability, which is a problem. But I think the, the basic theme was, would be of America first, use American power uh, only where there is an obvious American interest. And quite frankly, I think sometimes we miss the point that this is what other nations do as well. They see it differently, right? The Europeans see Germany first, France first, whatever, uh, China first as something that is in their interest. I mean, the Europeans, that's multilateralism, you know, climate change, whatever. Um, that's their national interest enveloped in a, in a multilateral structure like the EU. And, and America, we don't have that, so it's slightly different. But, I, you know, it, it's, it's an odd one with the president because I think he doesn't particularly find foreign policy that interesting. But, you know, if you look at China, American leadership there, the South China Sea, is more consistent, I would say, than the previous two presidents so, with American... So, yeah, yeah, but you were looking contemplative, so go ahead. And then we're going to come back to China. Well, I want to talk about China. Oh, very good. So let's just go to China then. Uh, I mean, the president isn't erudite. I don't think he would claim to be on foreign policy. But again, China is a very uh, worthwhile example of what I think some of us are talking about, which is that the bipartisan consensus of the so-called smart set, you know, the Beltway bandits. I used to be down there with a guy and, and some others in D.C. and now I'm in New York. It was business as usual with China. China's going to get bigger and richer and as long as we just keep doing stuff with them, complain occasionally about human rights, but not really, because they'll get more liberal as they get bigger and more powerful. One, that's turned out to be not true. That is not, as we see in Hong Kong, as well as a lot of other examples we could point to. And, and, and I, I, I mean this in earnest. There has been a bipartisan failure stretching back, really, I would argue, for my entire lifetime, to understand what China is trying to accomplish, to understand how to deal with China. And President Trump is like the guy who walks into the room and says, enough is enough. Now, you know, he's not giving a speech. This isn't the, you know, the, uh, the funeral oration from Heracles or whatever. I mean, he's not gonna be a guy that necessarily is known forever for the way that he outlines a strategy. But on the basics of China stealing amounts of, and, and again, Bush administration, Obama administration, Clinton administration, go back. For, I mean, stealing intellectual property, which is really our greatest single advantage as a civilization in the world, in a way that is unprecedented in human history. And we sort of sit around, well, we have like a couple of demarches, or we have some diplomats who say, hey, can you stop stealing our military and intelligence and commercial secrets? Trump, now you can argue with whether the trade war is the way to do this, but the other option was actually to just kind of suffer in silence. So while it's not necessarily the most sophisticated take you'll get from this president on why China's doing bad stuff, his recognition that China is doing bad stuff 
is a game changer. And now you'll see people in the foreign policy establishment are like, yeah, I guess that was pretty bad that you were doing before. Didn't have it's, it's, an, it's, it's an instinct, certainly for him, right? It's a gut feeling on China and, and it's something that he's acted on and talked about on the campaign trail in 2016 a lot, the whole China issue. And, but there again, there, there seems to be sometimes a disconnect with his very tough rhetoric on China and frankly his tough actions on China and then he has what seemed to me to be like slam dunk opportunities like on Hong Kong and even with the whole NBA thing where I'm like, dude, this is this is like perfect, just dunk the ball and he sort of backs off a little bit and he's reportedly telling Xi, well, I won't comment publicly if we can get this deal done because he wants to get the deal done for political reasons at home. What's your read on Trump and China broadly as someone from obviously a, a different uh, political vantage point? I think that's ultimately then the downside of not tracking details and really looking at the implications of rhetoric and how rhetoric needs to translate into a particular set of actions. Remember Stephen Moore, the economic advisor said, well, in this trade war, I guess we just underestimated that China's willing to suffer more than, than we thought they would. Right, it's a command economy. They don't care if their people um, start starving or they lose. We care. They if put them in concentration camps. They're not gonna. Right, like, so of course like, that should be part of the calculus and understanding of how you're negotiating because guess what? 25% tariff hike, who's that hurting? American farmers who lost their contracts. That's hurting, hurting steel industries. People who are looking for inputs from overseas to make their products, yada, yada. So some of this is the, the, there is a history there to tap into. I'm not saying it's a repeat the way other leaders did this, but the awareness or understanding matters. And we tend to glorify the idea of a bull in a china shop and look around and you're like, all right, great. Right, like this shit's broken. That's great. Now it's broken. Now what do we do? And I don't, I don't see the articulation of what do we do now? And we all, this well, is the part of it would be also, David, that it was broken before the bull got in there. Right, it was now you broken. put a bull in there. That's awesome. Now let me corral the bull and still fix the broken China. What do you think of that? Yeah, so We're like way out of this metaphor. Yeah, so. So, so, so just a little, a little bit to reach back to the Middle East for one quick second. Um, you know, mo most people don't know, uh, you know, the reason that we, we are allowed to operate in the Middle East is this obscure thing called the AUMF, right? The Authorization for Use of Military Force. And it really is very narrow, and it says basically the U.S. can be there and chase the people who were responsible for, for basically falling the Twin Towers. And, and, and the further you get away from that, the more tenuous our legal ability to stay there is, right? So there was a great deal of questioning whether that actually, you know, it, it, it extended into Syria. And, and the fact that the Congress hasn't re-voted or debated the authorization for use of military force is 19 years old, okay? The Congress voted on it one time, 19 years ago. So the fact that the U.S. government hasn't had a full-throated debate on whether America's sons and daughters should go die in far-off places is really a terrible thing. And, and the Congress should have a debate. You can, people get up there, Lindsey Graham and others can slam the president, but until they go, and pass a, a new authorization that says, here are the things we articulate that we think are worth dying for. It, it's really, you're at the end of a very, very, very long, skinny limb, in my opinion. And on China, you know, China is in this, China's looking at the United States and saying, we'll wait for another 5,000 years. You guys keep punching and punching. It is real. It is a sacrifice that I think Americans are willing to make. You know, are you willing to pay 50 more bucks for a lazy boy soap that's made in China so that they don't steal all our intellectual property and buy our ports and own all our debt? I think the president has made a political calculus that that's exactly what Americans are willing to do. And in that instance, if it's described more articulately, I think you would. If you travel abroad, go to any country in Africa, the airport, the schools, the train station are all built by the Chinese. In, in, South America, all around the world, the Belt and Road strategy, the Chinese are, we're just gonna, we're not gonna conquer you with a military force, we're just gonna buy you. And that's been what's taking place, slowly and silently. I also feel like when we talk about foreign policy, there's this, there's this tendency among, especially the media, to just race to the hottest object and talk about that incessantly. If we were having this exact same panel nine months ago or something, we'd be talking a lot about North Korea because of that whole gambit from the Trump administration. Tom, what is the status of our North Korea effort? Yeah, well, you know, I think the, uh, 
It's going to be interesting with North Korea. I, I think Kim Jong Un is about to launch an ICBM again, do another test, which he's had a moratorium on since November 2017. I think the North Korean challenge is that President Trump, to his credit, has not reduced the sanctions regime as the North Koreans expected. Traditionally, you know, American presidents would say we're going to take a hard line. North Koreans would gradually escalate. We've seen that in the past few months with a few missile tests shorter than ICBM range. Um, we have seen I, I, North Korea's problem is that Kim Jong-un uh, needs to extract some sanctions relief, but hasn't come to the decision, the grand bargain decision, to at least give up his ICBM program. So I, I think we're heading into renewed dangerous waters on that. Um, we'll see what happens. A but, quick update on that. Um, with Kim Jong-un this past week, and there's another layer of negotiations going on in Sweden at the lower levels between the two countries, um, and they issued a threat to the United States saying, if you don't treat us nicely or behave by the end of the year, we're going to do stuff. So they've already done the short-range missile tests, and they're effectively threatening um, the long-range missile tests by the end of the year. So I think North Korea is interesting because it all started really with this debate over whether or not the president should have direct talks with Kim Jong-un. And there was, once again, apparently I'm like the anti-bipartisan foreign policy consensus guy. There was this idea that if you speak to Kim Jong-un, you'll elevate him on the world stage, and this will be some, people would always say this and repeat this, and other folks that I knew who were willing to be a little contrarian would say, that he's not subject to elections, is that he's the most dictator of dictators of anyone in the entire world. He's already elevated as high as can possibly be, because he'll execute anybody that, that questions it. So the president talking to him, as long as he keeps in place all of the structures and, and, and possible countermeasures, seem like a reasonable idea, even though people have been saying, oh, you can't do this, you can't do this. I will say that the president doesn't get anywhere with this. It's going to look bad for him. I mean, this is a gamble he's taken on foreign policy. I think it's too early yet, but if we get to the point where the missiles start getting fired off again, people say, well, not a huge loss, but obviously not any real gain. And if you want to be really terrified, there's a book by, uh, I think his, his name is D.B. Myers, um, called The Cleanest Race. He's a North Korea expert, and he talks about the, uh, it's essentially the fascism that is actually at the heart of it. It's really not a communist state, it's really something more along the lines of Japanese imperial uh, racial purity ideology that is massively militaristic. And while a lot of people obviously just wish that they could live in a normal country, this has been inculcated in the whole place to the degree that maybe they really do think that the whole country is being built just for the purpose of one great final war. Enough people to actually bring that war about. It's pretty, it's a scary place. I and mean, the more you get into North Korea, the very less cheery, likely to cheery Sunday morning thoughts from Buck. Uh, so, David, I, I, briefly I, I, before I get to our last question, then we get to uh, Q&A. I, I was going to say, I had the opportunity. I was in Korea about three weeks ago. Went to the DMZ, met with lots of Korean uh, intelligence officials, U.S. intelligence officials, and uh, you know, spent a good deal of time in the DMZ walking around, talking to soldiers, uh, uh, Korean soldiers, rock soldiers, U.S. soldiers. Interestingly, you know, no, there are no weapons on the DMZ anymore at all. So soldiers on both sides are no longer armed, which is an incredible thing when you go there and see. You, and the gun towers that used to have machine guns pointing in each direction, they're tape big tape was signed on by both sides, the North Koreans and the U.S. and ROC forces. So it, it, it's been de-escalated at that level, the, the hair trigger level. Um, I, I got a great sense, you know, from, from talking to the folks there. Um, Steve Began, who is the special envoy for North Korea, makes many trips back and forth into the, 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 the facility across the, in the DMZ and the, on the North Korean side. So there are a lot of ongoing talks, but as it has been pointed out, there's only one person in this in this whole puzzle that can make any move, and it's, it's Kim Jong Un. Whether he wants to move the ball forward is up to him. If, if, if he does take one step to denuclearization, I think you would see there's a big factory city just north of the DMZ, which would spring to life if South Koreans are ready to start exporting and, and really move things forward. But it's really up to Kim Jong Un whether he's going to go into obliteration or towards a more capitalistic uh, free society. So uh, one thing that strikes me when I think about the foreign policy currently under the administration is that there are a lot of counterintuitive things that are happening, sometimes going a little bit underneath the radar. And you, you know, we talk about Middle Eastern policy, and there's this congealing of this uh, alliance among Sunni states and Israel as a bulwark against Iran, which I think is a very good development. Uh, you have the, the, the Mexican government 
really cooperating to a surprising degree with the Trump administration when it comes to the border crisis. There's sort of like a, a list of things that you can go down. Uh, the, the gap, the canyon between some of President Trump's rhetoric on Russia versus the actual policy when it comes to Russia. Last question before we go to the audience. What is the, the biggest surprising thing in the Trump administration's foreign policy in your mind that we've seen so far? And I, I'm sort of putting you on the spot. Is there something that has surprised you, David? He's on his phone. Um, that's biggest surprise, Trump foreign policy. The biggest surprise of the Trump foreign policy. We can come back. Your last to thing was a mic drop. That was let, let, let's, listen, so I, I do think the biggest surprise of U.S. foreign policy, from, even from talking to the folks on the ground in the DMZ, was the president walking across, shaking Kim Jong Un's hand. That was not only symbol, it was it was symbolism that was it was really really important. I think it was an incredible, uh, an incredibly um, uh, bold move, and I think it was it, it, like you said, the like Buck said. Huge upside, huge downside. Very surprised by it. Tom? You know, I, I, I think the um, biggest surprise, most interesting thing that doesn't get a lot of coverage, or it's getting more, this is a purple thing because I'm interested in this, the UAP issue, or unidentified aerial phenomena, like what the Navy has been saying, that is a real issue. Something that's going on there, it's not China, it's not the United States, it's not Russia. It's interesting. The administration will take it seriously. Whoever wins the next election will take it seriously as well. But that's just something I sort of opt into that, you know. But when the you UFO talk to people, answer is a terrific answer. The, if you talk to people <laughs> like in the IC, the intelligence community or the military, it's like, they're like, yeah, we, this, this is this is Politicon or Comic-Con? I don't know which one. Tom, 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 Tom you were storming Area 51. Uh, I'm not storming Area 51. Take my word for it. Like, that is, that issue is not going away. Fuck. I think the administration's ability to understand the complexity of the Mexico slash Central America issue in general has been, I'm, I'm pleased to see that they understand some of the, uh, the elements going on. And, just and they've struck agreements that like get no they, coverage. They've struck agreements, the president, I was in El Salvador traveling with the Secretary of State a couple months ago, and the president of El Salvador is like, the administration is right, we need to make this a better place so that our people, meaning the Trump administration, but our people aren't just leaving. Why is our country so troubled right now? What, how do we find allies to work with us to make this a better place? Which, you know, and I was there with other people who were saying, this is unusual rhetoric, certainly not you hear a lot of other Latin American countries these days. Getting some cooperation from Mexico, I would also just say, I think Mexico is much more troubled right now as a country than a lot of people realize. Um, if you did not see, it's worth just doing a quick Google search on the cartel effectively taking over a major Mexican city in Culiacan uh, about a week or so ago, 10 days ago, took over the city. 800 Sicario uh, assassins from the cartel because the son of uh, El Chapo Guzman, Ovidio Guzman, was in police slash you know, paramilitary custody. So they just said, okay, we're gonna unleash all of our guns all over the city. And the president of Mexico said, let him go. When the cartel has that kind of power in broad daylight, this president in particular, Ope, uh, uh, Obrador, uh, uh, Lopez Obrador, thank you. Um, he has tried to take this approach to let's not do the drug war as it was done before. Well, guess what? Now the cartels are probably more powerful than they have ever been, slash Mexico had an all-time murder high last year. I think it was 35,000 murders in Mexico, about that number, which was their all-time high for the year, for, for, since they've been counted. Just rainbows and butterflies surround Buck Sexton at all times. Uh, last but not least, ma'am. Um, I would say the, the full-throated embrace of leaders of all stripes, um, which is daring and different, um, but at the same time, the quick wins and easy opportunities to stand up for American values overseas, which is simple statements like the Hong Kong one, not talking about how Hong Kong, the people protesters were waving the American flag and what that meant, um, I think is a diminishing of American values and leadership. I would also, to answer my own question, it's happened a while ago, but the actual moving of the embassy to Jerusalem, which had been promised and promised and promised, for him to actually follow through and do it, I think stunned a lot of people, and a lot of the parade of horribles that were predicted have not materialized. So maybe a, a couple of surprises there. Let's take a few questions. We have a couple minutes if you'd like, and again, we try to uh, think of a question as one or two sentences with a question mark, starting with you, sir. Hi, obviously, how does the concept of public condemnation of the president's foreign policy symbol hold our enemies by making him think all they have to do is wait until he's out of office and do so 
factor when you're merging. So the wait him out issue. I think that's a legitimate concern on China at some level. Now, look, hold on. Let me backtrack for a second. I mean, you're always going to have criticism of foreign policy, right? And we need to have criticism of foreign policy because people mess up all the time. And the people that are supposed to know everything don't. So start from that. And they actually don't have, when I was in the CIA, other people here have worked at national security level at very, national security at very high levels. There's not some crystal ball that people get to look into that they know the future. Okay, with that, with that said, I do think that in China right now, there's a, maybe not a 5,000 years for this issue, although who knows, there's a wait them out strategy to see who that, because if the next democratic administration comes in, they're probably gonna say this trade war is crazy and well, trying to get it to go back. So I think that might be the one place I see that. Yes, especially when you see Joe Biden, not to pick on any one particular candidate, but he's the only candidate that's come out and said, China's not a problem. I think China's our biggest national security and economic problem by far. Not even, all this Russia obsession stuff is crazy. Russia is a paper tiger. I mean, they got a lot of nukes, but we don't think they're gonna fire those at us. Next question. Thank you for the insightful panel. As a guest in this country who's very fond of this place, uh, I want to ask you, is not the greatest threat to the security and future of the U.S. its internal political division? What is your take on that? Very good question. Mm -hmm. You're the political guy to answer. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, look. Uh, obviously, there. You know, some of the greatest acts of, of domestic terrorism: Timothy McVeigh, right, in uh, Oklahoma City. The, just the, the rank political discourse that takes place every day in the Congress. A absolutely, uh, there's civil discourse. I mean, you know. Uh, I, I go on CNN, we, we go on CNN a lot, we disagree, we're still friends, we can, you can have civil discourse in this country, unfortunately, um, it slips and slips, and, and so uh, when it slips just across the line, it should be condemned. Um, there, there, you know, we, can, we can devolve into a nation that, that, uh, that does you know, de decay from within, and then it's, it's all our jobs to make sure that doesn't happen. Seen that um, for many folks in my family included, where my, my parents were raised under a dictatorship overseas, that it's very easy often to fall back on the idea that, well, we just all need to agree and do the same thing because that's better and we'll be stronger that way. So I do want to shout out that civil discourse is fundamental to who we are and how we want to practice democracy. And it's hard and it's not easy and we need to learn to do better. Um, when it devolves into violence, that's a problem. But I would say, the, the vast majority of progress that we have made in our country since the founding of the Constitution is because people were making good trouble. Um, and that's a necessary part of the practice of how we become better. I would, I would also add that on that particular question, that's one that it's an issue that bothers me a lot. Um, I think we're at a dangerous point where it feels like, and it does not apply to everyone, but I think at the polls, when it feels like we actively hate each other more than we can come together and fight in a real enemy, that's where I start to get nervous. And I, I sometimes feel like we're heading in that direction. You know, as an American who grew up abroad, I think I'm a lot more optimistic. I think we go through these cycles, but you look at American history from the 1960s, the civil strife then, the domestic terrorism. I think we go through cycles and then we come back together, but maybe I'm delusional. Earlier, you guys had a conversation on whether Turkey was in our tent or out of the tent, but it's a time that we actually pushed them out of our tent, buying S-235s, leaving their borders open, for, leaving their borders for us to ISIS fighters going into Syria. Uh, Baghdadi's chief deputy was treated for free in a Turkish private hospital in 2014. Do you think they even should be our ally at this point? Do you think it's worth it? And, and it's, some of it's just a technical question. If they are in NATO, they are by definition an ally. Is, is there a process for throwing someone out of yeah, there. Yeah, there's not really a both them off the island. Uh, and, and even getting them in was its own thing, right? For a long time, they had bipartisan division on whether or not they should be in to begin with, and the in was based on strategic location and economic engagement, um, and the ability for American businesses to really benefit um, from having these relationships within Turkey, um, European allies, yada, yada. The and have a large Muslim majority country yeah, in the NATO the, alliance, which was also but, and the government and at the time, different. they were a more progressive, yeah. secular Muslim audience, right. too, which I think is critical. I mean, literally, it straddles Asia and Europe between the Bosphorus River. So you're like one side on Asia, you can step with the other is Europe. Um, so I think the changing nature of Turkey is also problematic for many of the people within Turkey, too. 
um, that they are becoming more politically Islamist under Erdogan than what they were before. I, 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 would, I, would just say, I would say, but for the geographic location, they'd probably be outside of 10. Yeah. They're, they're incredible, important crossroads, a choke point for you know, the, the entire And have Russian, been for about exactly, 4,000 years. Yeah, yeah. Right, exactly. The, the, the only warm water Russian ports that they have. Right? And yeah. that, that's the recognition that just because you're allies doesn't mean you trust everything that a person does. I think this is a fallacy people have about diplomacy, is that it's based on you trust that they're going to do stuff. No, actually, every negotiation has within it layers of you prove this, then I'll prove this. No, like, I, it's the trust but verify. No, I, I, think, I think that's right. You don't implicitly trust every ally. You trust certain allies, of course, much more closely than you would others. But I think the, the fundamental premise of the question was, should we be talking about them as an ally at all? It's not a gradient of trust. It's are they even remotely an ally? I, I think we should for the simple reason for all the issues we face. You know, it's that question of waiting out. Waiting out Erdogan is not as silly as it sounds. If you look at the politics in Turkey domestically, he lost Istanbul, which is his, his home area. Uh, the Kemalist party is rising in support. And when they come back in, you could see a shift back. I also think with that, you know, the, the, the idea of protecting NATO's southern flank, if the Russian Black Sea fleet starts coming in in a major conflict, got a pretty big problem. Also, just keeping stability, right? Keeping Erdogan in there sort of deters him from messing around with the Greeks and Cyprus, keeping things calm, calm waters, you know, keep it calm. They also wouldn't let us open up a front in northern Iraq in the second Persian Gulf War. And by the way, when ISIS fighters, and they knew it, were streaming into Syria by the thousands, they were like, come on in. So and I, I, wouldn't call the, problems, right? I wouldn't call the current situation calm either, what they're doing with it, an invasion. It could be, it always could be worse. Yes, last question. So my question is about the Republican message, because one thing I noticed in the last two years when I started paying attention to politics is the majority of Republicans are horrible storytellers. But it's easy for, let's say, someone like Nancy Pelosi to say to any Republican politician that laws don't work, immigration, race, is Nazi, but she cannot be put on camera to say the same thing to the Border Patrol Second Chief in San Diego. So now... Can I just say how refreshing it is to hear that Democrats aren't the worst messengers? That's so now, here's my question, because Evil responds to evil, right? So how can Republicans elevate the people and say they're on the front lines that are nonpartisan that the American people will support and allow them to deliver the message for them? And is it appropriate? Yeah. Well, the, the, the bigger problem is, is going to be that people that do, to the points made earlier about the national security apparatus, law enforcement slash national security apparatus, you, we've already seen a lot, and this is a can of worms that are over, a lot of politicization going on all over the place. My former employer, the CIA, FBI, all this stuff that's going on. So those frontline guys, they know the truth and they can always, they pass up the information, but you're always gonna have politicals at the top of these apparatuses who are the ones that have to make the case. Because if you put the frontline guys out there, now they're being politicized too in their day-to-day -day work and get caught up in the, are you playing for a team or are you playing for America? Political team. And I, I enjoyed your interjection because one of the most fascinating things in American politics the left base and the right base both fervently believe that the other side is more ruthless, more unified, better messaging than their own, and they believe it about the other side, which is sort of a, a really interesting dynamic, but it's true. Please thank our panel for a really fascinating conversation on a very eventful day. Thank you. Thanks,